Good morning, Paul. It's Tuesday, the 28th of February. Here's the heads up brief for today. For the Southeast Asia okay. production, we covered 22 issues. In North Asia, we covered seven. And for the Australasia and Pacific Islands, we covered eight. Eight. In South Asia, we covered 18 issues, plus the major issues in the Europe, Middle East, and Africa regions. Okay, great. Go ahead, Uda. Right, so Paul, tensions are still high in Wamena in Papua following the riot in which uh, 12 people were killed when security forces opened fire on a mob. Um, Indonesian authorities are investigating policemen and their involvement in it. The West Papua National Liberation Army has also issued threats against uh, Indonesian forces in Baliem Valley, which is where Wamena sits. Okay, now you mean they've issued that post riots and post yes. the killings or prior to? Post. Okay, so this is very interesting, especially in light of the um, fiasco that occurred at the football stadium in Surabaya. Um, you know, when you look at riot control or any actions by the police in an indeed military in a, in a civil or an urban role, it's all about the appropriate use of force. And you have to question when something can get to the point where 12 people have to be fatally shot, that obviously there's a lot of history there, but there's also some unusual crowd control measures to enable it to get to that level, which is of course something that is a scar on the country now. It's plied in Papua is very much scarred by the behavior of its security forces. They're often focused by money and acting in a most um, impertinent manner using force in the most unmeasured ways. Um, of course, this all compounds into the various unrests we see there now. Our Indonesian, the army in particular, has come a long, long way. The TPNPB, we know, are psychopathic thugs and murderers. So the fact that they're you know, issuing threats against Indonesian forces while this is going on is showing a, a similar level of bombastic behaviour which sets the climate on both sides for violence and, and of course some justified paranoia on the security forces side but the psychopathic nature of the TPNPB and the unprofessional nature of riot control and inappropriate use of government resources for security forces to make money and to run political and business agendas is of grave concern and the inability for ministers in central Jakarta to get a hold of their security forces to train them, to give them appropriate budgets so they can act with professionalism rather than economic interests. That all points to a bit of a Looney Tune situation, one that's been going on, let's face it, now for five decades. So these cultural issues on both sides of the fence are of concern. What is um, not well known is that many Papuans understand the complexities of having, you know, in the vicinity of 300 languages just on the western side of New Guinea and Indonesian Papua as opposed to Papua New Guinea that has another 350 odd languages themselves. I don't mean dialects, I mean languages. So, of course, the complexities of running an independent state can be seen in the corruption and issues that are evident in PNG. So many Papuans are actually very measured and and not pro-independence um, because, sadly, not because they don't feel in their heart they'd like to be self-governed, but they know the irrationality of many of these TPNPB-type thugs is going to be um, unchecked if there is at least an independent power, even if it is one that perhaps is somewhat overly ruthless. But thanks for the update. And... Um, can't say it surprises me after my, my travels across the archipelago to see this news come out. Thank you. Right. Uh, Paul, the Indonesian Minister for National Development Planning, has stated that the government will continue to uh, support and develop the nickel downstreaming policy to bolster economic and industrial growth in the country. They're looking to create smelters in North Maluku for this purpose. Yes, yeah, but that's been a, a long path. I mean, there are many other challenges there to the nickel, but the overabundance of Chinese investors unregulated in terms of bringing in labour, the clashes that that's causing at a communal level, these are all issues of grave interest, um, not just purely the 
building of smelters. There's a lot more to this than meets the eye for us to continue to monitor. Thank you. Right. In Malaysia, uh, people from Singapore, Brunei, New Zealand, Australia, Japan, South Korea, Saudi Arabia, Germany, the United States, and the United Kingdom uh, can now use the Autogate facilities to clear immigration at the Kuala Lumpur International Airport so they can pass through faster. Okay, thank you. Uh, in Myanmar, a spokesman for the Nestle Food Company announced uh, that it will halt all production. It said its head office and factory in Yangon are expected to cease operations and um, they will move distribution and the markets to Thailand, Malaysia and the Philippines. Yes, and look, of course, on top of that, we've seen PTT and PDTEP undergoing significant political pressures from within Myanmar now. Um, of course, they are justifying that as supporting a the energy critical requirements of Myanmar and Southeast Asia. And I mean, clearly that's a public relations uh, statement to cover the fact that you're making oodles of money. We're seeing Western companies um, pretend to pull out and whilst they may hand over operations, they're not so keen to hand over their shareholdings. So some of those oil and gas companies are operating at a most untoward manner, which is most consistent with how they set their agendas. But this is a very interesting twist. Um, frankly, um, I'd incorrectly assumed Nestle had actually carried out that process a while ago, but to hear it's just come about formally now is um, a little bit bewildering given the conditions that are occurring in Myanmar and how long and the nature of those actions by the government there. It's kind of outstanding that Nestle took so long to make such a decision after so many Western companies have pulled out. And what's even more bewildering is how many are still um, keeping a low profile and hoping the smoke screen that they have laid shall obscure their activities a little longer. <laughs> okay, thanks. Right. In South Asia, protests broke out across India following the arrest of a political party leader, who's also the deputy chief minister of Delhi. Uh, he has been arrested on a corruption case, which uh, his party believes is politically motivated. Protests are likely to continue over the next few days, and they'll be concentrated in Delhi. Well, and was that uh, Manish Sisodia? Yes. Which, which parties? He's with the Aam Admi Party, Paul. Okay, thank you. In Pakistan, uh, the Islamist Tariq -e Labaik Pakistan will hold uh, nationwide protests against inflation uh, across the country on the 3rd of March. Uh, this will be interesting because this is the first protest uh, that the Tariq -e Labaik Pakistan has called for in months. They were the ones behind the disruptive protests uh, calling for the expulsion of the French ambassador in 2022. Okay, thank you. Yep, yeah, gotcha. Yeah. In Nepal, uh, the Communist Party of Nepal, uh, the unified Marxist-Leninist faction, has withdrawn support from the government. Uh, this is a major coalition party in the government, and uh, it announced it will quit the coalition, and it looks like the government will fall soon at this rate. Okay, that's um, noted. Thank you. Yeah. Lastly, in the Europe, Middle East, and Africa region, in Spain, a far-right party filed a no-confidence motion against the government. It's likely to fail, but it comes amidst an increasing far-right sentiments in the country. Uh, this has been brought on due to the cost of living crisis. Okay. In Ukraine, Russia is moving to encircle Bakhmut city, which where there has been intense uh, fighting for months. It seems that Russia is yeah. going to take over. Yeah, and let's keep a real close eye on that. I mean, it's one of thousands of indicators we're currently monitoring in terms of that situation moving either in a most unlikely way towards peace. But most, of course, of those indicators are about how it's based on escalations occurring. And if they do secure Bakhmut, that's one of the key um, um, indicators of the war going to intensify. So, yeah, go, go ahead. Uh, a Hungarian Airlines will suspend flights to Moldova over concerns of security over its airspace. Uh, this is as Moldova calls for more Western support. Uh, there's fears that Russian-backed separatists in a disputed region may be mobilized, and it comes amidst the rising tensions with Moldova siding more with the West than NATO. 
Yeah, can you? What was the name of the airline? If you don't have it handy, could you just flick it through to me? Because I want to just read off against our um, risk tolerance ratings for each airline. Sure, we'll do, Paul. Thank you. That's the heads up brief for today, Paul. Anything else from you? No, not at the moment. Thank you. All right, thanks.